One of my favorite ways to look at complexity is through something called Kinevin, which is a decision-making framework developed by David Snowden. Snowden is really a brilliant thinker, and I encourage you to explore his work further on cognitive-edge.com. Kinevin is a Welsh word that literally translates to habitat or place. The more nuanced translation, though, is important. Kinevin refers to the multiple places that make up who we are, which might include religious, geographic, family, and ethnic heritage, all of which influence our views and decisions in ways that we are likely minimally aware so the name itself describes a complex system. At first glance, the Kinevin framework may look like a standard consulting four-quadrant grid, but the curvy lines, squiggles, and oddly shaped spot in the middle are all intentional. But let's first describe the main categories. On the right side, we are describing systems that are currently in what is called an ordered state, meaning cause and effect are predictable. If I take these steps, I will consistently get the same outcome over and over again. The right side is divided into two types of ordered systems. On the bottom, cause and effect are obvious to any reasonable person without study. In an obvious system, the decision-making process is to sense the problem or opportunity, categorize it, and then respond with the best practice for that category of problem or opportunity. This is the only domain in the framework where best practices are appropriate. On the top right, the systems are more complicated, and cause and effect are predictable, but can only be understood through logical analysis or through bringing in experts in that type of system. So, instead of sense categorize respond, here we have a decision-making process of sense analyze respond. This is the domain of good practice, meaning there are probably multiple right ways to address the problem or opportunity, and forcing a single best way will cause people to be frustrated and to disengage. The left side describes systems that are currently in an unordered state, meaning cause and effect are inherently unpredictable. At the top left, we have a system where cause and effect are only clear in hindsight. They cannot be predicted ahead of time. This type of system is known as a complex system. Complex systems have unpredictable emergent outcomes. Because we can't predict up front, the decision-making process is to first probe the system to see what we can learn, conducting safe-to-fail experiments. We sense the outcomes and then respond by either amplifying or dampening the change. Complex systems are the realm of emergent practice. New patterns that are typically effective for a limited amount of time since the system is under constant change. On the bottom left, we have a type of system where cause and effect are not related. Chaotic systems can be created intentionally for the purposes of innovation or accidentally. When they are entered accidentally, the decision making process is to act rapidly to stabilize the situation, sense whether the system is now stable then respond accordingly. With no cause and effect clear, this is the realm of novel practice. At the beginning of the video, we called this a decision-making framework. That is because, depending on which type of system we are working with at the time, we will think and act in very different ways. This brings us to the center, which we call disorder, meaning we don't know which of the domains we are in. This is the space we are in most of the time, which leads to people acting based on personal preference rather than by analyzing which of the four decision-making processes are most appropriate. Some people prefer to apply a clear process in every situation. Some prefer to take the time to analyze and research. Others want to get together a diverse group and try experiments. And others want absolute authority to take unilateral, fast, and decisive action. Finally, let's take a look at this little squiggly wave, which relates to a unique kind of boundary between obvious and chaotic. When we treat all problems as obvious, we get complacent. We assume nothing will change, that it's always worked, therefore it always will. And then suddenly something does change, and our standard processes don't account for that. Now we move rapidly into chaos, where recovery is difficult and expensive. 
Snowden's article in the Harvard Business Review calls this transition from obvious to chaos falling off the cliff. Most of our management efforts should be focused in the complicated and complex domains, only using the obvious domain for things that are low risk and appropriately predictable to avoid this potential to fall off the cliff. Agile frameworks are designed to function along the boundary of complex and complicated. Let's take a simple Scrum product development example. Product development is an inherently complex type of problem since we can't accurately predict exactly which features and services a customer might want, how they might use them together in various workflows, and exactly what technological approaches might best deliver those solutions. For many years, most organizations have treated this problem as if it is complicated, devoting more and more time and expertise to analyzing the problems up front. Since they are using the wrong domain to solve this problem, the results don't get better with more analysis. Scrum treats the product development problem as if it is complex. We get a cross-functional group together. We add constraints to the system by prioritizing and thinly slicing the most important work to do first. This constrained amount of work is developed during a safe-to-fail experiment called a sprint. We execute the sprint as if it may be complicated work, doing expert analysis through product backlog refinement and sprint planning to create the plan. We then oscillate between the complicated and complex domains during the sprint, planning the next day's work, and then sensing whether the plan still makes sense during the daily scrum meeting, changing the plan as appropriate. The sprint review and retrospectives then allow us to sense whether we got the desired outcomes from that experiment, with amplifying or dampening steps captured as changes to the product backlog, the output of the sprint review meeting, and system improvements, the output of the sprint retrospective meeting. From time to time, an organization may choose to intentionally go into chaos for a constrained period of time. Hackathons and 20% time used in some organizations are examples of this intentional dip into chaos. We make these safe by limiting the amount of time spent there and examining the outcomes at the end of the time period to decide how to make them useful.